for joining us today. Um, I think we're waiting for a number of people to still join, but since it's after two o'clock, uh, I do think it's time that we we start this process uh, because we don't want to keep everyone waiting, especially uh, since tomorrow's Good Friday, and we probably all want to go and enjoy our week, Easter weekend. Um, yeah, the way this is going to work uh, today is that. Oh wow, my slide shows. The way this is going to work today is uh, we we as serious have decided to um, create a, a webinar so that we can help inform people about this new version six of FSSC twenty two thousand. Uh, we're doing this for free. We're doing it uh, to first make you or help you understand it, uh, to take you through it. Uh, we want to have it as a bit of a questions and answers session, so that if there is any uncertainty, we can we can uh, try and find clarity as a group of people, and yeah, just uh, give awareness. But on that note, uh, everyone needs to have certificates because you'll all be audited on it at some point. So what we're offering is that at the end of the three sessions, we're going to do one session today, uh, one next week and one the week after that. And after the three sessions, uh, everyone who's attended these sessions will send out a link uh, that you can click on. You can write a bit of a Google test and based on the test results, we'll issue a certificate for this training. So effectively, this is a free training course on the latest version of FSSC 22000. Uh, just a brief introduction because we've got a number of, of people that are attending. Uh, I just wanted to introduce those that might not know Sirius SA yet uh, about what, what we are, who we are, what we do, and just a brief introduction of that and then we'll get stuck into, into this version 6. So Sirius is a food safety business. That's our core function, but we've expanded. We've expanded into a number of different areas. We are a solutions-driven business to assist the greater food industry. And it may come in the, side, in the sort of form of consulting, and specifically with reference to food safety management systems and developing systems. But we also have accredited training. We have uh, electronic software that we supply. We are very involved with development of products and supply of ingredients in the form of technological packs. So we won't want to send you a commodity like salt and sugar, but we will want to mix salt and sugar with some stabilizers and send you a pack to make your life easier. So our, our sort of uh, main thing is making your life easier and if anyone needs assistance with anything maybe you need new staff members maybe you need questions answered about microbiology or allergen management maybe you need to manage impartiality in the internal audit process effectively anything you need assistance with we'll help you and we've got a team of 13 people in cape town that can assist and we've recently opened up our johannesburg office uh, based in, well, our person's based in Centurion, but she's available to go through Aachau, Teng, or anywhere else uh, that's needed. So yeah, we've got a South African national footprint and we can assist. So feel free to contact us, send us an email, contact me directly, my number's at the bottom there. Um, yeah, and we can engage and, and go from there. Um, you're not sharing, okay? No, I'm not sharing. Oh, no, that's not good. I've just been told I'm not screen sharing. I should have done that earlier. So there's our Here we go. Sorry about that, everybody. I wasn't screen sharing earlier. Now I'm screen sharing. So get in hold of us, contact us on the email address or the telephone number, and uh, let us know where we can assist you going forward. So let's get stuck into uh, FSSC 22000 version 6. This was released on the 1st of April. I thought it was a bit of an April Fool's joke. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't a joke. It's a real thing and it's quite a mouthful to get into. So um, 
We're going to split this into three sessions just so that we can grasp each session. Today's session is probably the boring part. This is understanding the scope. What does it entail? Who is it applicable to? What changes have they made within the scope of the management system? And then next week and the following week, we'll actually get into the nitty gritty of the additional requirements. At the end of today's presentation, we'll, we'll list the additional requirements, so you'll see what's been added. Unfortunately, nothing's been removed. Uh, one could argue that uh, this is getting a bit big. Uh, however, it's a, it's a necessary thing to make sure that food safety management is, is achieved. Uh, if one looks at previous audits and just the way auditing has happened, it, it used to be easy to pass audits. It's not easy anymore. And uh, food safety incidents still happen. So it's not about making the audit difficult, but it's about trying to complete the system to try and assist in uh, completing food safety properly. So incorporating management elements, incorporating verification, incorporating a number of other things is the focus so that we can have comprehensive food safety. And then one of the other big goals that they've done within FSSC is to incorporate sustainability. Uh, sustainability is a, a very big buzzword and not only a buzzword, we need to protect the environment. So they've included that within the scope. So today we're going to get into uh, FSSC and what the scheme is all about. You can download the scheme. I hope everyone that's attending here today has downloaded it. You're welcome to follow the, the scheme document uh, if you have it in front of you, but we've effectively copied and pasted the scheme document so that uh, you can just go through it and understand what's going on. So the first part of the scheme document is the introduction into FSSC version 6. It was published in April 2023 and uh, there are three real focuses. So the first thing that they've done is they've incorporated the ISO 22003-1 2022. That was published last year by ISO. That is a uh, document and I just want to bring it up for you or a standard by ISO, which talks about the requirements of bodies providing audits and certification. The majority of us attending today are not audit bodies, so this is not really applicable to us, but they've aligned the FSSC requirements to make sure that the audits are aligned with ISO 22003. So, yeah, we don't really have to worry too much of it from a manufacturing perspective. If anyone here is a certification body attendee, well then, that will be applicable to you. The focus today, though, is, is actually going through the, uh, I suppose, manufacturing elements, the guys that are compliant that want an FSCC certificate within their facility and not how to conduct the audits. They've also uh, looked at strengthening the requirements to support organizations in their contributions to meeting sustainable development goals. So it's all about sustainability. That's been a big focus of the FSCC. And then just general editorial changes to the standard as part of the continuous improvement process. So the big thing is the FSSC has got together and said, how are we going to improve what we do, or continuously improve? And that's really resulted in creating the changes that they have created. So if we get into the scheme overview, part one, uh, this is really the change document that has been uh, provided by the FSSC. You'll notice that it, it starts with the scope. The rest is all the, the normal stuff that goes on. First thing, farming of animals is not part of the changes, and they've added handling of plants, they've added trading, they've added e-commerce, and that's effectively those changes that they've added. Uh, we'll go into the nitty gritties of those, but they've added uh, handling of plants, trading, and e-commerce as separate uh, additional sections. In terms of the actual scheme, there used to be a thing called uh, Food Safety uh, FSSC 22000Q or quality. That's been removed. So this ISO 9001 offering has been completely removed. 
Uh, they've also removed reference to quality. They're talking about an organization's management system. And we'll see uh, in the next two weeks how they've actually incorporated quality into uh, all the clauses of the system. So they've just simplified the, the scheme and talk about a single management system. And they've upgraded the reference to ISO 22000 to the latest version, 2018. So previously it was the prior version to 2018, now it's referencing 2018. The, the rest remain the same. So we've got the management system uh, section, we have the PRP that's relevant to your sector, and we have the additional requirements. And if we take note, there are now 18 additional requirements and not 15, as you saw in version 5.1. So they've added additional requirements and then made changes to current ones. Ultimately, we've got to meet the technical spec, which is your PRPs. We've got to meet the management system, ISO 22000 and the additional requirements. So that structure still remains uh, very similar to what we had in the past. So uh, the most important thing when you're applying for an audit and when you're understanding an audit is what category do I fall under and what subcategory do I fall under? So the most important thing is to find out because based on the category, you're going to determine which PRPs you need. Category A falls away. Farming is no longer considered a scope of 22,000. So that's a good thing. I don't think we have any farmers in the, in the building here, but if you do farm animals, you don't fall under the scope of FSSC and cannot get a certificate for uh, this audit if you are a farmer. Category B, 3.1, handling of plants. This is a new category. They've added an entire new category about handling of plants. And if one goes through all the specifics here, refer to the handling plants that do not transform the product from the original whole form. So if we have a, an apple or an orange, we're not cutting the orange, we are just maybe putting a wax coating on it and shipping it in a box. It is a plant, it's still a plant, it remains a plant, nothing's happened to the plant. The minute we do something to the plant in the form of processing, and they explain it very clearly here, cutting, dicing, peeling, changing the product, then it doesn't fall under B, it goes under category C. Category C is processing as we all know. If we are handling plants within a pack house environment, we have to still comply to ISO 22000, technical spec 22002-1, which is the same PRP technical spec for processing. So it's a different scope with the same technical spec and then the additional requirements that are relevant to category B. And so uh, the scope is very specific in terms of uh, harvested plants, not transforming the product from the whole form. And then uh, it includes the processes that you might do to a plant product like cleaning, washing, rinsing, etc. Category C is the typical food processing manufacturing category. They've added a new subcategory, category Z C0 converting animal carcasses, including processes such as layerage, slaughter, evisceration, bulk chilling, freezing, and bulk storage. That category C0 is specifically for avatars. It's where you take an animal, where an animal turns from an animal, a living thing, into a carcass and, and food product, and they look at that entire process until being stored. That is the first category. Category C1, is after that process of C0, you're going to take the animal and process and pack it into some form of product. So perishable animal products, as far as anything, I suppose even if we look at meat, sausages, salamis, you know, the real processing of the animal product, that falls into C1. C2 is specifically for perishable plant-based products. So if there's any form of animal mixed in with the plant, it does not fall under C2. And if there's any animal that's uh, mixed in with plant, it's not under C1. 
C2 is purely for plant-based products, and they've been very specific to talk about plant-based meat and dairy substitutes and the processing of pet food. Sorry about that. Uh, from plant products. Included in plant-based products is water-based products, such as ice, so yeah, frozen water, juices, vegetables, grains, anything that's not animal-based and is purely plant-based or non-animal-based falls under the plant-based scope. C3 is when we mix plants and animals together. So if we make a pizza, we've got uh, a meat component and we've got a, a plant-based flour component. So this is really your, your typical, most, most processing plants, unless you have a vegan manufacturing facility or meat processing facility, most have some sort of mixture of animal products. The most important understanding is in all three, C1, C2, and C3, we're talking about perishable. Perishable means it goes off. It doesn't last forever. So we probably have some sort of freezing involved, or some sort of cold chain involved to maintain the, the form of the, the product and to protect the shelf life of the product. If you're dealing in ambient products, uh, ambient products would be something that can be stored at ambient temperatures, uh, things like water, oil, beverages, pasta, snacks, breads, etc. It's not requiring cold chain, that falls under C4. Um, and then they put a very specific thing regarding uh, category C, foods for special dietary needs and foods for special medical purposes. So the likes of CBD oil, we're legally classified as a food. This is a very important thing that we need to understand. Some countries, like in South Africa, have classified CBD as a medical product. It might be a Schedule Zero drug under certain conditions, uh, and, but it's still a Schedule Zero drug under a medical product. It has not been classified as a food item. So some countries say it's a food item, some countries say it's not a food item. If it's considered a food item regulated under food regulations in the specific country, it can be included as a Category C item. Obviously, CBD is a animal-based, uh, not animal, plant-based product. So as a plant-based product, CBD uh, would fall under C2 uh, or put into C4 if, if it's an ambient stable uh, product, depending on where it's added. If uh, in the country of manufacture, CBD is considered a medical product, like in South Africa, one can't get certified for manufacturing that product. Right. So just to get into the specifics again, C0, animal primary conversion at the abattoir, it still uses technical spec 22002-1, that remains the same. Uh, processing of perishable animal products, uh, including fish, fish products, seafood, meat, eggs, and dairy. Eggs is also brought in this, so it's not necessarily the meat component, it's also the uh, other byproducts such as eggs and dairy, requiring chilling or frozen temperature control. So it's the whole point of managing perishable. Or processing pet food from animal products only. So you'll notice pet food, and we'll expand on this a little bit later, because previously there used to be a pet food section. If pet food is manufactured from animal products, it falls under perishable animal products. C2 under perishable plant-based products, uh, that's your meat substitutes, dairy substitutes, yeah, it's easy to click on the wrong thing here. Uh, and any pet food one makes from plant products only falls under perishable plant-based products processing. So pet food, and that's typically the pet food we would have for our cats and dogs at home, uh, falls under processed products as opposed to a specific area for pet food products. And if you're making those pet foods, one also has to have the ISO TS 22002-1. So it's the same specification or PRP requirement in a food manufacturing plant as it is for a pet food manufacturing plant. 
the same goes for perishables. We've covered this already. Uh, that's when it's mixed and ambient stable products, ambient stable pet food, all the same. Same technical specification. Category D. Category D talks specifically about animal feed production. Painted food, as you can see here, used to be specifically included in animal feed production. It has now gone to category C. So category D is merely for animal food, uh, animal feed. It could be processing of animal feed material intended for food and non-food producing animals not kept in households and processing of feed mixtures with or without additives intended for food producing animals. So when we're looking at adding premixes, this is all about feeding animals, feeding animals that are not kept in a household, so having a feedlot or farming, uh, and then obviously feed mixtures within that, uh, within that uh, section of, of of the the yeah within that scope, obviously animal feeds itself uh, yeah specific for farming and then if it's an animal that's at house so the big thing is if you keep an animal at home then it's considered pet feed I think that's the the main thing category E has always been there it's catering uh, catering uh, they uh, specified when catering is serviced directly to consumers or delivered directly to consumers, so if I make a sandwich and I give it to a consumer, that's considered catering. The food is prepared for on-site consumption or takeaway. Uh, in examples include units that serve food directly to the consumer or offer food for immediate consumption. So any sort of restaurant, hotel, cafeteria, and onboard passenger services. I suppose that come under the, the likes of, uh, yeah, uh, doing things on site for people. I wonder if something like an airline would fall under that because they assist in preparation of food and hand it over to you. And then catering sites, handling foods uh, with direct serving to consumers. So canteens, coffee shops, food trucks, and event catering. So this catering service is actually giving us everything outside of manufacturing, where food is delivered to people. Um, and the definition here, very specifically, you'll see that the technical spec refers to 22002 dash 2. Dash 2 has slightly different PRP requirements uh, for what's required for these, these, uh, these elements. And it's sort of defined as open exposed food activities such as cooking, mixing and blending, preparation of components and products for on-site direct consumer consumption or takeaways. Examples include hotels, restaurants, food trucks, institutions, workplaces, school or factory cafeterias, including retail with on-site preparation. So in a pick and pay or a Woolworths where you've got a rotisserie, that would fall under this whole catering process. Uh, it includes the reheating of foods, event catering, coffee shops, and pubs. This is a, an interesting one, obviously, with the uptake of e-commerce and uh, drop shipping and those type of, of mechanisms. Category F is talking about trading, retail, wholesale, and e-commerce. I'm thinking the likes of Take A Lot, who sell food products, they can have an FSSC certificate for how they handle their food that they trade and sell. This has become very, very specific. Uh, food chain F1 applies to retail and wholesale activities and related e-commerce activities. Retail is defined as selling goods to the final consumer or the final customer, example the consumer, in small quantities for consumption and not for the purpose of resale, that goes to the end user. Retailers have physical buildings and facilities, example shops and warehouses. Something like ShopRite or Pick and Pay will have distribution centers, they have their own warehouses, they have the logistics that get the product to the shop. 
So Pick and Pay could have a an FSSC certificate for food safety for their shops and their whole system. Wholesale is defined as buying the goods from a manufacturer or other sellers and selling of goods to other businesses such as resellers, uh, retailers, industries and occasionally end consumers. So the whole wholesale market where I might buy from someone and send to someone else, uh, that's within the trading route. Uh, this is all similar to what was done before they, they've just added a few words in here. And one of the big words they've added in is the whole e-commerce uh, setup. So where a retailer or wholesaler, 6060 may offer internet sales and deliveries, e-commerce. So the whole 6060 app and delivery mechanism can be incorporated in a category F uh, section. Mr. Delivery, for instance, could be one of those uh, those people that can be certified against uh, Category F because they are part of the e-commerce and delivery of food items. Uh, wholesalers always take ownership of the products and activities, it may include food, feed, or packaging products for food and feed. So it's quite interesting that they talk, you know, if you are handling primary packaging and you wholesale and distribute packaging, it also could fall under category F. For both retail and wholesale, minor processing activities that only serve to give pre-prepared food a final processing step may be included. They've taken out grilling of meat, baking of bread, but they've kept in or they've added reheating of ready-to-eat foods, cutting, cutting or portioning of meat or fish. So that would be somewhere, say, for instance, uh, at a fish counter in a retailer where they fill it a fish, uh, portion it for you, uh, or reheat food. So maybe uh, cooking a pie or warming up a pie that would form part of, of this F1 category. F2 is a category that's added uh, in, entirely, and it's for the food brokering, trading, and e-commerce activities, and it's specifically deals with food brokering and trading uh, result, uh, re due to the, the buying and selling of products on its own account without physically handling or as an agent for others, uh, any item that enters the food chain. So you're not touching the food. You're not doing anything to the food. F1 does something to the food. F2 doesn't do anything to the food, but you're still within this food supply chain and you have a responsibility to ensure safety of that food product. Food e-commerce is the buying and selling of food products over an electronic network without physical handling. So the big thing is the lack of physically physical handling with, with e-commerce uh, and the trading aspects. If we look at uh, e-commerce and trading, F1 and F2, the big thing here is they're referring to PAS 221-2013 as the additional requirement. So the specifications are not an ISO 22000 requirement, it's a PAS 221-2013. And uh, with food brokering, there are no PRPs because you don't handle the product, so there's nothing to handle. But there's still a management element to make sure that the risks are avoided and there's additional requirements specific to it, which we'll get into later. Okay, quite simplistic, I think, there. Category G, regarding transport and storage of food. So they've added in here, and they've included not just repacking, but relabeling of products as, as one of the things that can happen. So any third-party logistics service provider who physically store and or transport food, feed, or feed food packaging materials regardless of legal ownership. So if I'm you, you're contracting someone to move my product, they can form part of this category G. It may include additional activities such as repacking or relabeling of packed products, freezing and thawing activities. Manufacturers, caterers or retailers, wholesalers that only store and or transport their own products and do not provide a service to others shall be audited under the category linked to their production activities. So if you do it yourself, you know, say I've got a manufacturing facility and the manufacturing facility transports the food, they'll be linked to that category of manufacturing, maybe category C or, or whichever one it falls under. 
So this is specific for the people that are, are the outsourced transporters. One that comes to mind would be a Liban Logistics who has cold storage, uh, not cold storage, cold transport. So they'll come and pick up your carcasses, take them somewhere and deliver them. They'll pick up uh, product from one place and deliver it to the DCs uh, or deliver from DCs through to shops in the retail market. Manufacturers, caterers or retailers uh, or wholesalers who also provide storage and or transport activities to organizations other than their own site shall also require category G in addition to the relevant manufacturing category. So if you are taking your own stuff to your own shop, it's all under your own manufacturing. If you are taking your stuff to someone else, you can also be a applicable to the category G requirements. Other organizations also refer to subsidiaries or sister companies. So uh, if you're going to other, uh, you know, your sister company here, your sister company there, you fall under category G. And category G, the only thing about category G is they've got a different technical spec. So if you do form part of category G by delivering to other uh, businesses other than yourselves, one would need to look at the technical spec 22002-5. They have removed other elements out of here, so there's only one category G for the transport and storage services. Category I is has been elaborated on in a very big way. It's about food product packaging and packaging materials. Uh, if we look at this, they've got their own technical spec again, 22002-4, published in 2013. Uh, and they've incorporated a hell of a lot. It's not that they've deleted, they've just elaborated. So they're very specific about uh, what packaging is. It includes plastic, cartons, paper, metal, glass, wood, and other materials. So any form of packaging forms under here. It's for food and feed packaging, feed being animal feed packaging. If we look at number or oh, section A, number letter A, uh, direct food contact surfaces or materials, physically touching the food. So we're looking at primary packaging that will be in contact with the food during normal use and for the food packaging, including labels and food. I don't even know how to pronounce that word, desiccants, uh, with direct food contact. So. The, this is all about something touching food. If it's touching food, it's a, a category IA. If it's not in direct food contact, um, the surface doesn't actually touch the food uh, during normal use of food factory, but there's a possibility for the substance to be transferred to the food, including labels applied to primary packaging. So section B, it's not supposed to be there, but it might touch. The primary food and if it touches food it forms part of uh, section b c uh, closing packaging materials such as tape plastic strips or other can be included in category i when the manufacturer can prove that it will be applied to a food or feed primary packaging material uh, if we can prove that it is part of the primary packaging material mechanism it forms part of category I. If not, it does not form part of category I. Disposable tableware can only be certified when it is sold together as part of the food product. Examples are spoons that are packed with yogurt, forks or chopsticks uh, packed with ready-to-eat food. The intended use, including that it is sold together and is part of the food product, shall clearly be specified. Disposable tableware that is intended for domestic home use is outside of the scope of the certification. So I make, if I'm making plastic forks that I sell at a retailer that someone can take home and use it at a, at a big party, that doesn't form part of this. But if I'm making plastic forks that go to a supplier who manufactures salads and they want to supply a fork with the salad, that does form part of category. Napkins and serviettes can only be certified when they are supplied specifically for use in food service. This intended use shall be clearly specified in the scope statement. So again, it's about the intent of what you or who you're supplying the, the napkins and serviettes to. 
Packaging materials such as aluminium foil, baking paper and plastic wrap, which are intended to be used in the preparation of foodstuffs within the food industry, may be certified. In which case the scope statement shall include that it is used for use within the food industry. Packaging materials of this nature that are not for use within the food industry are not intended or, or are intended for domestic home use are excluded. So the big thing is if you are manufacturing something with the intent to be used in the food industry, you can get your certification. If you're going to just be, I don't know, supplying it for someone that they can keep at their house, like your aluminium foil that you wrap your potatoes in on your brides, that is not forming part of this category. I suppose if your product uh, does that sort of private sale as well as is sold into food services or food manufacturing for a use, uh, then you can uh, form part of the category. It's all about manufacturing food at the end of the day in the manufacturing environment. Packaging activity is limited to inline unfolding of packaging, blowing of bottles, printing, etc. are not considered as food packaging activities are in, and are included in the food scope of certification and therefore category one does not apply. So if I am Coca-Cola and I buy the preformed bottles, they're plastic bottles, they've, they've been manufactured in such a way that I just have to blow them so I can fill my Coke into it. That operation at Coca-Cola of blowing the bottle is not considered a category I, uh, it's not applicable for category I. And so you can't get certified for the blowing of the bottle. If you have an inline production primary packaging, such as bottles using resin to produce a preform, so the people making the preforms using a resin and creating that preform, and then you blow the bottle, that is considered a packaging activity and shall be considered in the scope of category I. So where you actually uh, are making the resins or using the resins to blow the bottle, that's where the risks are, are sort of considered and that's where the packaging is uh, considered a part of category I. Packaging material used for personal care, pharmaceutical products and other non-food uses are outside the scope of the scheme. So you can only get this certification against category I if you are part of the food supply chain, not pharmaceuticals, not personal care, not non-food items. Right. Category K, uh, production of biochemicals, category K. Food chain category K involves the production of chemical and biochemical products and applies to the production of food and feed additives, vitamins, minerals, biocultures, flavorings, enzymes, gases, and processing aid. One of the big thing gases there being uh, things like modified atmosphere packaging. They can fall under category K and get an FSSC certificate. Food supplements, where legally classified as food within the country of manufacture, may be included under food chain category K. If the product is classified as a pharmaceutical or medical product under legislation, then it is outside the scope of FSCC. So this is that whole debate about CBD. Is CBD a food item or is CBD a medical substance? If it's considered a medical substance in the country, then it falls outside the scope of FSCC and cannot be included within that scope. Um, so yeah, this is really looking more at the sort of processing aids and and whatnot. Uh, a lot of ingredients, especially in the functional superfood world, are going this route. And, and so I think in the next well, in the next while we'll see a lot more additives coming from this, this category. If you are manufacturing any of these type of uh, products, these byproducts, uh, all products, vitamins, minerals, etc., they fall under the technical spec 22002-1, which is the same as a food manufacturing spec. And so the same food standards apply if you're manufacturing these type of products that are used in food. Right, that is all the scopes. One scope was removed and a whole lot were 
added onto or they, they elaborated on. So that that takes us through the scope section. Uh, next week we'll cover the additional requirements. Uh, we split it up in two because that's going to be an absolute mouthful. Today's a little bit uh, quicker. I think next week will be a hell of a lot longer, uh, but we'll go through those in detail. Just to let you know what they are, what you're in for uh, next week, we're going to split these in two. So we're going to cover the first nine in the first section, or in the first session, and then we'll cover the second nine on the 20th. Uh, they have not taken away any of them, so we still have management of services and purchased material. We still have product labeling and printed material. We still have food defense, food fraud, the use of the logo, management of allergens and environmental monitoring. They've added a section on food safety and quality culture. That's going to be a big one. They've added a section on quality control. So remember previously we talked about getting rid of ISO 9001 requirements with this FSSCQ, but they've built in the additional requirement of quality control. So effectively, everyone's being forced to add the quality aspect into their business uh, if they want to maintain their certification. Transport storage and warehousing is the same. Hazard control and measures for preventing cross-contamination is the same. They've elaborated on all of these, so they're not the same requirements, but we haven't, uh, it's still the same flaws that we're referring to. PRP verification, product design and development, health status, all the same. We've added stuff regarding equipment management. We've added stuff regarding food loss and waste. We've added stuff regarding communication. And then lastly, which is still the same, but they've elaborated a lot more, is the requirements for organizations with multi-site certifications. So that's what we're in for next week. It's going to be a, a mouthful, uh, but I think uh, we'll provide a lot more clarity. Today's one uh, is probably the boring section. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any questions from anyone. I don't know if anyone wants to type in the, in the chat bar regarding questions. But yeah, feel free to, to uh, send us questions so that we can get to, uh, get to help answer them, get to help clarify and whatnot. So if that's everything, everyone, thank you for attending. We really appreciate it. Uh, enjoy your Easter weekend and we'll see you two o'clock Thursday next week.